So, tonight we continue a study in Reformation 500. That sounds a wee bit like some kind of game on the Xbox or the the PlayStation or something like that, but it's not. It's uh, uh, prompted by the anniversary at the end of this month of the uh, nailing of the 95 Thesis that uh, Martin Luther uh, published on the 31st of October 1517, 500 years ago, and that is generally recognized as uh, the moment when Europe changed and when the world changed because the church was debating 500 years ago what the gospel really was, what the church really was. And um, in the centuries leading up to that date and following, there have been great changes. So uh, this morning we were thinking about the role of Scripture in the life of the believer and in the life of the church, and that really has to be foundational to let God have the first word and the last word in every discussion. We listen to God and we follow what he says. We're going to take another topic tonight, assurance, looking at Hebrews chapter 10. Next Sunday morning, James will take another angle and look at the great topic of how we are declared right in God's sight, justification, justification by faith alone. A great, great discovery of the Reformation or rediscovery because it's there in the New Testament writings and indeed in the Psalms and was always there. But it was stressed afresh 500 years ago at the Reformation. So what I'd like to do tonight is spend our time looking in particular at the passage Rhoda read in Hebrews 10 and homing in particularly on verses 19 to 23 or verses 20 2 to 23. Let's just read 22 to 23 again. Hebrews 10, verse 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. I want us tonight to celebrate assurance, being certain that we are believers, that we are saved, that we are forgiven, that we have access to God as a great gift to us from Christ and from the Scripture, a gift rediscovered by the church at the Reformation. Celebrate assurance. Well, just to introduce, most of us know that 500 years ago there were huge arguments, huge disagreements, and some of them were political. The Reformation in England, for example, would not have happened without Henry VIII and his Uh, serial adulteries and marriages uh, having an impact on his decision to break with the Pope and with Rome. And yet God can work through politics and through people with mixed motives. And there were many, many people in the Kingdom of England who wanted the church reformed and were quite happy to go along with the king uh, uh, permitting that. Things were different in Scotland and Generally, historians would say that Reformation in Scotland was not a top-down thing, but was a bottom-up thing, that there was pressure from the ordinary people and from more local leaders in the community to reform the church, that it was not from a palace. It wasn't imposed from above in Scotland. We're thinking a lot this morning about Martin Luther and the experience in Germany in the early 1500s. And maybe through this month, we'll think about other countries and other uh, leaders who featured in the Reformation. But the main thing we want to do is listen to the Bible itself. 
So there was turmoil in the uh, 1500s. There was turmoil in many people's lives and in many, many communities in that period. Upheaval. What were they arguing about, though? What were the issues in the 15th century, the 1400s, what were the issues that really bothered people? Well, it might surprise you that one of the big deals was assurance and whether it's actually possible to be sure that you have peace with God in this life, to be sure that when you die, you're going to go to a better place, to be in heaven, to be looking forward to the resurrection, to a new heaven and a new earth. Before the Reformation, the official teaching of the church, quite different from the teaching of the Bible, was that no one could be sure, and that to claim to be sure, to claim to have peace with God, was sinful. So I want us to explore that topic this evening and see actually what the Bible has to say. You may not have heard of him, but there was a fairly major figure in the Roman Catholic Church at the time. He was a man, an Italian cardinal called Robert Bellarmine or Roberto Bellarmino. His dates are 1542 to 1621. He was involved in what was called historically the Catholic Reformation or the Counter-Reformation, uh, he was part of the response of the Roman Catholic Church to the Protestant movement, and he is still regarded as a very authoritative teacher in uh, Catholicism and in its history. He was a man, for example, who called in Galileo and told him to stop teaching the theory of Copernicus that the earth is a planet that orbits the star we call the sun. And uh, he said, that's not what the church accepts, and you should stop. You, you're allowed to believe it, but you should stop teaching this publicly. You've got to keep it to yourself, because the official teaching of the church, they misunderstood their science, and they misunderstood their, their church history. They misunderstood the early church fathers, and they misunderstood the Bible, and they decided as a church in, the, in that period that uh, the church was going to teach the idea that the sun orbited the earth poor Galileo. Well, this uh, man, Cardinal uh, Ballarmino, was wrong about that theory of the solar system. But he was also wrong about his Christianity. Because he said famously, you may have heard me quote this before, that the greatest Protestant heresy is to teach people that they can be sure they have peace with God at the Council of Trent and in the, the reaction to Protestantism that took place within the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church resisted this idea of assurance powerfully. The greatest Protestant heresy is assurance, says the Cardinal. So that leads me to ask, and we'll get our answer out of Hebrews 10, is Jesus Christ alone enough? to save your soul. Is Jesus and knowing Jesus, is Jesus and believing in Jesus, is Jesus and placing your trust and your faith in Jesus, is that alone enough to save your soul? If it is, you can know that. But if it's not enough to save your soul, then there's got to be a question mark. And if something else is required to save your soul, something that may take a whole lifetime, or something that may go on beyond your death, then no one can have assurance. And that was one of the great debates of the Middle Ages and of the Reformation period. The plain Bible truth in Hebrews chapter 10 is that brothers, sisters, we may have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. 
We can do so by a new and living way, not through the tabernacle or the temple of the Old Testament, not through the temple at Jerusalem, not through the Levitical priesthood, not through the sacrifices of Israel, but we can come by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain that is his body, the body of Jesus. And since we have Jesus as our great priest over the house of God, verse 22 of Hebrews 10, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. How could any Christian doubt these words? How could anyone who's read all the way from Hebrews 1 to Hebrews 10 doubt that on every page of this letter to Jewish people who've become Christians, again and again and again, the writer of Hebrews says, there is a figure, Jesus Christ, who is greater than all the priests who've ever gone before, greater than any priest in the line of the family of Moses and Aaron, greater than any priest that Israel ever produced, not from their line at all, but from a totally different line because he has no beginning. He has no end. He is an eternal priest like Melchizedek who met Abraham in the book of Genesis. He's a divine priest. He's God who came down onto the earth to be our priest. And he made a sacrifice. And it's better than all the other sacrifices. And it paid for all the sins of God's people. And he sat down after his sacrifice. He doesn't need to offer a sacrifice again. There was one sacrifice made once for all for sins. Jesus offered himself, and his body was torn. He's gone through that torn body back to God, offering himself to God in the place of sinners. And God has accepted that sacrifice. That's the whole argument of Hebrews right up to this point. And Hebrews 10 verse 19 says, Therefore, because this priest, not like Aaron and the other Aaronic priests, this priest like Melchizedek, an eternal priest, because he has done everything to satisfy God and secure salvation. Therefore, we can draw near to God. Now, these people he was writing to were confused and doubt-ridden, backsliding sinners. They were tempted to go back to the synagogue. They were tempted to go back to relying on circumcision. They were tempted to go back to relying on Jewish feasts and festivals and all that. And he says to these compromised, wobbly believers, you can have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way that's been opened up for you. And you, despite all your inconsistency, you can come with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith knowing you're clean, that you've been sprinkled, cleansed from a guilty conscience, that your bodies have been washed with pure water, hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Don't give up on that hope. Don't let anyone take you away from that hope, for he who promised is faithful. In other words, God has promised to accept Christ and his sacrifice and to save you. Hold on. Keep going. Don't give up. Don't let anyone take you away from this settled assurance. So my question, is Jesus Christ alone enough to save your soul? The Bible in Hebrews says yes. And if anyone, cardinal, pope, church, denomination, if any Lutheran or Calvinist or Presbyterian says, ah, but you need more than faith in Jesus. You need to belong to our whatever. You need to be baptized in our way, or you need to have our chit or our certificate or follow our, our rules. No. Draw near through Jesus. He and he alone is enough to save your soul. If Hebrews is right and it's part of the written infallible word of God, then assurance is not only possible, but assurance of salvation is the plain teaching of the Bible. It's not a Protestant heresy. It's the honest truth of God's 
word. Draw near in full assurance of faith. So that was one of the great Reformation debates. Can a believer in Jesus know in this life that if they die, they are going to heaven? Have you heard of Joan of Arc? I'm sure you have. Joan of Arc is a heroine to the French people. She was eventually canonized by one branch of uh, the Roman Catholic Church, and she is now regarded as a saint. Uh, poor Joan, uh, she had visions, and she was very involved in, in fighting against the English who wanted to control France during the Hundred Years' War. And uh, she was often dressed as a man and dressed in battle gear, and uh, that was held against her. Um, and she was 19 when she was executed. Um, and bizarrely enough, one branch of the, the unreformed church condemned her as a heretic and had her burnt. And then a few years later, another branch of the unreformed church uh, church canonized her as a saint. So uh, you, you pick your bishop and you, you take your choice. But there were bishops who took the side of the English in the Hundred Years' War, and there were bishops who took the side of the French in the Hundred Years' War. Now, the trial of Joan of Arc took place around about the same time that the Reformation was on the go. She was put to death in 1431 at the age of just 19. And part of what she was condemned for was that she was asked if she believed she was in a state of grace, if she believed that God's grace was in her and that, you know, essentially that she was saved and she was going to go to heaven if she died. And it was one of those questions damned if you do, damned if you don't. There, there wasn't really an answer that she could give that wouldn't get her into trouble because the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church at that time was that no one could claim to have fixed, settled assurance and peace with God or to know that they were going to heaven. So that's why she was asked. They, they asked the question in the hope of condemning her. Here's part of the record of the trial before church courts in 1431. The judges in condemning Joan of Arc said, this woman sins when she says she is certain of being received into paradise as if she were already a partaker of glory, seeing that on this earthly journey no pilgrim knows if he is worthy of glory or of punishment, which the sovereign judge alone can tell. What was going on in the trial of Joan of Arc? Well, the church of her day had a wrong view of God, a wrong view of what it is to be saved, a wrong view of how to have peace. The church of her day thought that you have to try your best to stay in a state of grace and avoid sin and confess your sins when they come to the priest and receive his absolution. But watch out if you forget to confess any sins because you're in trouble over them. And watch out that you don't slip on a banana skin before you die because you could live a big part of your life in a state of grace and then spoil it at the end. So in other words, nobody knows, will I be good enough? Because you're adding, it's like you're putting money in the bank, but you're also spending money uh, because you're doing good things and you're doing bad things. Will my good things be good enough? Will I get over the line? Will I be good enough to enter glory? And God the judge will decide when your time is up. That's not Christianity. That sounds very like most of the sects. That sounds like Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or Islam. But that's not Christianity. Not the Christianity of the Bible. That's medieval Christianity, but it's not the Christianity of the Bible. And the Reformation protest is saying, this is a twisted view of God, a twisted view of righteousness. It was the view of, of Luther 
before his conversion. And Luther, when he was an Augustinian monk, Luther, when he was going to the Mass as a priest and performing the Mass, was full of horrible guilt. He had a breakdown at the altar because his hands were conjuring the bread into the body of Christ, and he felt dirty, and he was terrified that he, a sinner, was this close to Almighty God. He had no peace. Trying to confess sins and trying to remember sins. He'd go to his confessor and, and he'd run back to his confessor minutes later and say, I've remembered another one. Because he was in terror of God and he actually hated God. And that's what the church in the Middle Ages created a resentment of God's holiness and God's righteousness, a resentment of the idea that God was judged because nobody could ever be good enough and nobody could ever have peace. How different from John 14. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. You can have peace and assurance that your Lord is with you and that he's waiting for you. How different from uh, Jesus saying in John's gospel, I'm the vine, you're the branches. My life's in you. You're part of me, I'm part of you. How different from Jesus saying, are you weary and burdened? Come to me, I'll give you rest. There was no rest in medieval Christianity. There was just more stuff to do, and you could never relax and think, have I done enough for God? Is Jesus Christ enough to save your soul? Well, Hebrews says, you believe in him? Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. I want to move on to a second thing, and that's just simply to state that salvation in Jesus is certain. How do I know? Well, let me just paint a picture for you from the book of Hebrews that tells you that believers will hang on, that they are saved and that they will have peace with God. This from Hebrews 9, verses 14 and 15. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. The blood of Jesus cancels debt, cancels sin. There is a new covenant, a new relationship with God, because a price, the price of the blood of Christ has been paid to secure promises of an eternal inheritance. You're free from your sins, not in the future, right now. You're free from your sins because the price to free you and loose you has been paid. That's Hebrews 9. Or Hebrews 10, verse 10. We have been, note the tense, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We're not looking for an endless process of becoming good enough for God. We're not looking for an endless process that justification being made right in God's sight is, is dragged out over years or over a lifetime or in a post-death experience in purgatory. We're not talking about justification that's uncertain we have been made holy once. How? Through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He died once, and those he died for died with him and in him. And he was raised from the dead, and those he died for were raised from the dead with him. They have eternal life. Or take this one from Hebrews 10, verse 14. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. We don't need lots of sacrifices. We don't need lots of priests offering lots of Christs on lots of altars. 
representing the offering of Christ. We don't need that. Because one was enough. Salvation in and through Jesus is complete already, is certain already. It is, if you like, a done deal. There has been, by God's provision, one perfect sacrifice from one perfect high priest. And if you start to say, I need another priest or I need another experience, you are actually insulting God and insulting God's Son because you're saying, well, that death of Jesus on the cross is all very well, but it's not enough. I need to add to it. And the salvation that's in Jesus Christ is absolutely certain. It's a done deal because unlike all the other priests, this priest is finished. If you look with me at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11 and 12, this is the, the one that tells us that the priest Jesus described in Hebrews is finished. His work is over and done. He's finished his work. Here's the Old Testament priest who day after day every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again he offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. The Old Testament priests, they could tell you what the problem was but they couldn't really take the problem away. Verse 12, But then, but, but when this priest, Jesus, when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. The Old Testament priest never took a day off, never had a break. There was no provision in the tabernacle or in the temple for furniture where they could sit. The task was never ending. The guilt was never gone. The fear was never gone. This priest Jesus made one sacrifice at Calvary on the cross and now he's sitting down at the Father's right hand and he says, Father, I saved them. It's finished. It's over and done. Accept them as they come to you in my name as they come to you through me. He was born because God sent him to finish this work. He offered the body that he was given at the, the incarnation, the birth through Mary the Virgin. He gave that body to God as a sacrifice. We know it was a sacrifice accepted because he was raised from the dead after three days. God showed that he was pleased with Jesus God is faithful and God's Son is faithful. His mission to provide salvation and righteousness for us was a success. And it's completed. Mission accomplished. Hebrews 9 verse 28. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people and he will appear a second time not to bear sin but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. That's why in our reading tonight, in verse 23, we are told, Hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Salvation is certain if it is through faith in Jesus Christ. The problem in the Middle Ages was that the message got distorted. And the priesthood got distorted. And the church is getting between Jesus and those who need to know Jesus. The Reformation, I believe, was absolutely necessary. And it swept away so much that was in between people and the hope of the gospel. One of the things that was invented by the medieval church, a false teaching, nowhere mentioned in the Bible, is the teaching on purgatory as a place where you can go and suffer and pay for um, any debt that's left unpaid in your life um, after death. It's a horrible teaching. And it's not a scriptural teaching. It's not a biblical teaching at all. 
John Calvin, when he came along, says about the teaching on purgatory, it is a deadly fiction of Satan which nullifies the cross of Christ, inflicts unbearable contempt on God's mercy, and overturns and destroys our faith. Because it's basically saying, well, I know Christ died for sinners, but I also need to go and suffer a bit myself to finish the job. Contempt for the finished work of our great high priest. And instead of people having peace and, and joy and assurance, they're being told, well, the cross isn't enough. You've got to suffer as well. That to me sounds like all the merit-based religions in the world. Buddhism, merit-based. Hinduism, merit-based. And the medieval church said, you need to have enough brownie points, you need to have enough merit in the bank with God. And if you haven't got enough, well, maybe after death, you can get enough by suffering and having your family pay money to the church post your death to get you out of purgatory and into heaven. It's all nonsense because salvation is a gift and it's free and it's through Jesus Christ and him alone. Is Jesus alone enough to save your soul? Hebrews says yes. Yes. Because salvation in Jesus is absolutely certain. It is complete already. The third and the final thing tonight is to think then about the doubts and the fears that we may have. Because I suspect, although most of us know this stuff and believe this stuff, we still catch ourselves with fears and with uncertainties and with doubts. And we still catch ourselves thinking, well, I've been doing quite well lately, and because I've been doing quite well lately, God will love me more. And then something goes terribly wrong, and we lose our cool, we lose our temper, we shout, we swear, we fall out with somebody, we, we send a horrible message, a horrible email, and then we think, oh, now God doesn't love me so much. Well, we're behaving like medieval people if we think like that. We're not thinking like Christians if we think like that. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, John 3, 16, that whoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. Now, if you believe in Jesus, you have eternal life. Even if you've had a crummy week or a crummy month or a crummy decade... The question God asks is, was the blood of Christ shed for you on the cross? If it was, you don't have to add to it. So what should we do with our fears and our doubts? We should handle them by going to Jesus and admitting them and confessing them and saying, Lord, I'm full of fear. Show me again that your sacrifice is big enough for me. Show me again that your loving arms that were nailed to the cross, that they will hold me if I get cancer or if my marriage breaks down or if I'm alone and I'm lonely. Show me again that your hands are big enough to hold today and tomorrow and the future. Handle your doubt by going to Jesus with your fears, with your doubts. Do you feel half-hearted in your Christianity that you're not living the way God would have you live? The medieval Roman Catholic Church said, oh, these Protestants, they will, they will not care about being holy if they have assurance. They'll, they'll just think, oh, well, it doesn't matter what I do. Yeah, it does matter what you do. But what you do is not what gets you into heaven. What you do is not what gets you peace with God. What you do should flow out of a, a life of gratitude and thanksgiving. I don't think there's a better motive for living to please God than knowing you're safe. And God is your father. Even when you mess up, he's still your father. I have two daughters and a son. Now, I don't know if there's anything they could do that would ever make me say to them, don't ever come home again. 
I hope there's nothing. I hope there's nothing in my heart that would ever be hard enough and foolish enough to to think that's it. You're you're not my child anymore. Well, but I might. I might be unloving enough and selfish enough and and proud enough to to say, right, pack your bags. You're out. God isn't like that. God's fatherhood is not like that. Listen to Romans 8, verse 33. Who will bring any charge, any legal accusation against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Romans 8, verse 34. Who is he that condemns? Who will attack a believer? Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now, the people, the Roman Christians, were sinners, and they made mistakes. But Paul says, who can make a charge against you stick if Christ God's Son has died for you and is praying for you right now? No one. So don't give up and don't be afraid and don't despair. Christ is your priest forever. God will welcome you into his presence because Christ has done all you need to complete the job of salvation. Approach Jesus with confidence in hope. Approach Jesus with confidence in assurance, in full assurance of faith. And maybe I can just finish by quoting an earlier part of this letter to the Hebrews, a part at the end of chapter 4 that invites us to come with our prayers and with our fears and with our doubts and with our sorrows to our compassionate Savior, our compassionate great High Priest. At the end of Hebrews 4, verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great High Priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace, God's mercy throne, God's throne of grace. Let's approach God in prayer with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I've been in a few institutions where you were always scared if you came to the the door of the guy in charge and had to knock. Headmaster in primary school. He was a lovely man, but I was afraid of him. And if somebody told you to go and see the headmaster and you knocked on the door, you were in slight fear and trembling that you might be in trouble. Or the principal's office in the Free Church College when I was a student there, you didn't really want to be sent to the principal's office. They might put something in your file that would mean you'd never be moderator. You know what I'm saying? You really don't want to be on that carpet. This is different. Approach the Lord of the universe with confidence, with hope. Are you, are you sad? Are you afraid? Are you broken? Are you burdened? Draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Approach the throne of grace confidently, boldly, so that you may receive mercy. You don't deserve it. And find grace, God's gift. Find God's help in our time of need. Ah, he opens the file. And what does he see? The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. So the Reformation says to you, celebrate peace with God. Celebrate assurance. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters in Christ and we love the Lord Jesus. So says the Apostle John. I think the Apostle John and the Apostle who wrote Hebrews 
and Paul, who wrote the great letter to the Romans, I think these apostles know better than Bishop Roberto what's true. Jesus alone is enough to save your soul. Salvation in Jesus is sure and certain. You have an anchor for your soul. It will not move. So handle your fears, your doubts, not by despair, but by telling the loving Lord all about them. Draw near to God. He will not drive you away. The Reformation says, you are being given the secure love of a God who makes promises and he never goes back on them. He never leaves his debts unpaid. The grace of God, the love of God, the peace of God. We use these words almost every time we gather. Oh Lord, as we come to the end of this message tonight, we pray that in a wonderful and special way we will experience your grace, your mercy, your peace, and not be doubting you and not be doubting ourselves, but rather know that we may approach you confidently, boldly, by faith, and in Jesus' name. Amen.